In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel appointed for today concerns God as provider and sustainer. Very many questions about the Eucharistic nature of John 6, especially those later verses, which also shape the manner in which some uh, interpret, give us this day our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer, can inadvertently give Christians the impression that all meals in the Bible, or prayers for daily provision, should be over-interpreted, as if interpreting the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 simply as an example of God's intent to care continually for what he has made under-interprets the text, or under-appreciates under it. And this is not, of course, the same as saying that John 6 or the fourth petition have nothing whatsoever to do with the provision of the means of grace, but I would say it is by analogy, rather than by over-spiritualizing, what at first glance appears mundane. That is to say, Christ, our dear Lord, simply taking care of basic temporal needs, albeit in miraculous ways. In fact, our Lord Jesus uses images of ways God cares for his creation under the first article of the Creed to encourage his hearers to a greater measure of faith regarding, in the first place, the way God will care for their temporal provision. As, for example, in Matthew, he encourages his hearers away from anxiety about daily bread by directing them to God's meticulous care for those creatures who are not made in the image and the likeness of God. And so he says, quote, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And of course, as everyone knows, our Lord Jesus goes on further to the same effect with the way in which God clothes the grass with beautiful flowers. Grass, as he says, that will wither prior to autumn, is arrayed for just a short time. In the spring and early summer, more gloriously than Solomon was arrayed. This, to you, is an indication that God will put clothes on your back. And here, Jesus uses a comparison from the lesser, God's care for all creation, to the greater, God's particular care for the temporal needs of the crown of his creation, man upon him. And so in a similar way, our Lord Jesus uses the care a father shows his son as a comparative example from the lesser to the greater regarding the manner in which your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit. In Luke 11, he says, If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so again, in the daily care that is provided to a child through father and mother, they are all together to see the extent to which God's hand extends in granting the Holy Spirit, such that all in the home may indeed eat their daily bread, and likewise be called out of unrepentant unbelief to repentance and faith, and to holiness. Now, I don't know what it is, really, but it appears that comparisons from the lesser ways God cares for his creation to the greater ways are more effective in bolstering faith in the greater or more miraculous things he cares for than if God were to use those miraculous pieces of evidence to bolster our confidence in the way he cares for us in our everyday needs. It might be possible in this regard that man, as a limited creature, often forgets or lets fly by entirely how much God accomplishes in the means of grace. He easily forgets the miracles that God works. Take as an example the very topic of the multiplication of the loaves. In this case, the feeding of the fourth house. This would be a comparison from the greater to the lesser. Jesus provides bread to the eater in this miraculous way, which the disciples bore witness to and participated in. And of course, the feeding of the 5,000 had already occurred. Afterward, when they're in the 
boat again, his disciples, Jesus, warned them, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Just prior, Mark says, they had forgot to bring bread. And so they took this saying of our Lord Jesus as a rebuke that they had failed to pack enough provision. And wondering about this to themselves, and Jesus says, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? Also when I broke the seven for the four thousand, how is it that you do not understand? And we also see, of course, in the Old Testament reading, another example of the same problem. The people of God were witness to his mighty works. How that he destroyed Egypt and Egypt's gods. How that he worked signs that had never before been seen or were ever seen thereafter. How he drowned Pharaoh and his host in the depth of the sea and made a way of escape for his own people through the parting of the waters of the Red Sea. And this, all to say nothing of what he had done 400 years earlier in preserving Joseph's life, in providing him with dreams, exalting him to a position of authority, all so that he would save Jacob and his brothers. And yet we read, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness, to, uh, into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It's an amazing complaint, right? And Moses says, well, maybe the miraculous bread will show them that God works wonders. It's like, didn't they see enough? Evidently not. Again, the greater to the lesser, it seems not to translate as well from the lesser to the greater. Would that we had died, they said, because we're a bit hungry. It is as though all that God had done was totally forgotten. Indeed, the trouble, it doesn't end there. He does provide miraculous food from heaven, and he brings the quail, and he gives water from the rock, and he gives clothes that don't wear out for the 40 years they sojourn in the wilderness as another sign, and yet is grumbling after miserable grumbling. We have no food, they say. And yet they also say, we hate this food. We don't have any, and we hate the stuff that we have. The golden calf, this is your God, Aaron proclaims. And they may have responded in liturgical fashion, who brought us out of Egypt. They make it to the very edge of the land of Canaan, before the Jordan River. And they say, I don't think that uh, God can take care of the giants that are over there. They make us look like grasshoppers. And so we're not going across. Even though the other spies brought very many lush things for them to see. Somehow, inexplicably, Man is incapable of being convinced by a miracle to the effect that he knows God will care for his daily needs. That is, the weightier things God often does are forgotten when it comes even to lesser things. Uh, and in a kind of paradoxical way, Christ Jesus reminds all the more of the daily provisions that are given in order to spur on to a lively faith and trust that all the more, and indeed very much more, will be provided to the people of God by God who is merciful. In anxiousness, as for what you will eat, for example, and what you will put on, do you often find reprieve, knowing that if Christ Jesus has fed you with his holy body and his precious blood, well, surely he'll give you at least a piece of bread. He'll at least give you a glass of water, or perhaps you do, I hope. When you despair of providing clothes for your back and the backs of your children, do you think, well, Christ clothed us in his righteousness in baptism, so I suppose in the case he'll give us t-shirts and pants to wear. Again, perhaps you do. But the pattern of the sacred scripture seems to be reminders from the lesser to the greater. We diminish the lesser things too, of course, because as Luther says, we do not use the first article of the creed as we should. He writes in the Catechism, we ought, therefore, daily to practice this article, impress it upon our mind, and to remember in it all that meets our eyes, and in all good that falls to our lot. To focus, in other words, intently, it is to say, on all the ways that God has provided and provides for your daily bread. And the list really would be inexhaustible. Even this very day, you could name things from the rising of the sun to your rising out of bed 
to every breath that you have breathed heretofore, uh, to the breakfast that you ate, to the hands that provided the breakfast, to a hot shower. I mean, on and on and on. Does God multiply his care for his people, for all that he has made? And again, in some paradoxical way, it is the literal, little, littler things, the smaller things, the day-to-day -day ordinary things that give evidence uh, that greater care from God will be given. In the domestic sphere, an infant's confidence grows in father and mother each time his bottom is white. Each time he is dressed with clothes in the morning, each time he is shown little affections. For a father and mother dote over these small things, these imperceptible things, is that not enough evidence that they will do more and more also? And so what the saying of Jesus bears out is true. One who is faithful in a very little uh, is also faithful in much. And so God's care over budding life in the spring his care in the cracking eggs of a robin's nest and the little heads that pop out of those eggs. His care in clearing streams and rivers of runoff muck so I can go fishing. His care for spring fawns and calves. His care for many and many and many more things demonstrates his intent to feed and to clothe and to care for you. And the care you have already shown this day to your children is an image or analogy for the giving of the Holy Spirit. Is an image of the kingdom of God. And the provision of the feeding of the 5,000, which for Christ is a very little thing, is an image and an analogy for the multiplying of himself on altars all around the country, all around the world, such that you and all faithful Christians would be fed by food that does not perish. That miracle may not have sufficed as evidence to the disciples that their failure to bring bread was easily taken care of, as it was a comparison again from the greater to the lesser. But the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 uh, and Christ giving up his very body and his precious blood for the forgiveness of sins, this indeed is a comparison from the lesser to the greater. And so, dear Christians, take all that meets the eye, the very littlest things that your dear Lord provides, and refer it all upward. That if God gives you life here, well then he desires and will grant it world without end there. And if you do despair of a very great thing, we'll find a much smaller thing. Find a sparrow, perhaps, or a blade of grass. And know for a certain that God has, does, and will care for all the wants and needs you continue to have. Again, not the least of which is the forgiveness of sins. Through the atoning sacrifice of his dear Son, even Jesus Christ our Lord. To Christ be all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.